The war between Russia and Georgia in 2008 was the first European war of the 21st century. It was also the first war of Putin's new strategy, which aimed to end the US-led unipolar world and restore Russia's former power. The stories about how the conflict arose, why the war lasted only five days, and how the West betrayed Georgia and gave the green light to the future war with Ukraine. This is a story that shows how Putin thinks and what he wants. This is the Conflict Report. To understand how it all began, we should go back in time to the late 80s. Try to imagine the Soviet Union at the end of its existence. A great empire torn apart by local conflicts, the liberation movement of the republics. A population that had lost faith in building communism was forced to stand in line for hours to buy food. Their only hope for a better future was the creation of new free republics. As a result, in 1991, all the accumulated problems led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Kremlin lost direct control over 140 million people who now built their lives in newly created states. However, the fairy tale of a new happy future for many free republics did not materialize. The political vacuum created by the collapse of the Soviet Empire led to internal power struggles and separatist movements within the newly created states. The young leaders of Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova had to deal with the activity of pro-Russian regions that were dissatisfied with the collapse of the USSR and felt more sympathetic to Moscow than to newly formed states. In most cases, this separatism was fueled by Russia itself, which thus tried to influence the policies of Kyiv, Chisinau, or Tbilisi and maintain, if not direct, then at least significant influence on the lost territories. For example, the conflict in Transnistria was primarily caused by Russia's fear of Moldova's potential unification with Romania and the complete loss of control over the region. However, we'll make a separate video about this. As for Georgia, when the country declared its independence in 1991, Moscow's leadership reported to its favorite policy of destabilization and began actively supporting South Ossetian and Abkhazian separatists. In the early 90s, Georgia was being torn apart from within, and shortly after gaining independence, it lost control of two of its regions. To understand Putin's psychology, it's enough to look at one of his early speeches, where he stated, the collapse of the Soviet Union is the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century a man whose biggest dream is to restore the Soviet Union. Having started his career in the KGB, the Russian president realized one thing very well. If you want to be respected, you have to be feared. Putin felt humiliated by what Russia had gone through in the 90s, by the fact that it was no longer feared, and he believed, respected. When the so-called Rose Revolution took place in Georgia in 2003 and the old authoritarian president was replaced by a young pro-European politician, Putin was firmly convinced that it was all planned by the United States. And in this way, America's trying to get Georgia out of Russian control. When similar events occurred in Ukraine a year later, Putin decided to regain by force what he considered to be his right. And by his, he meant all the former Soviet republics. From then on, wars in Georgia and Ukraine were only a matter of time. In 2007, the Russian president took part in the Munich Security Conference, where he delivered a speech that became a turning point in Russia's global policy. The entire system of law of one state, first and foremost, the United States, has transgressed its national borders in all spheres. Putin blasted the unipolar world and U.S. hegemony, saying that Russia's always enjoyed the privilege of pursuing an independent foreign policy, and it's not going to change this tradition. Many American politicians perceived this speech as the beginning of a new Cold War. 
But why was Georgia so crucial to Putin? For centuries, Transcaucasia had been an important buffer zone between Ottomans, Russians, and Persians. These territories became especially valuable after the discovery of oil fields in what is now Azerbaijan. Although Georgia does not contain such deposits, it does have an oil pipeline that transports oil from Caspian Sea Wells to Turkey, as well as access to the Black Sea coast, which allows for water transportation. Georgian increasing cooperation with the West threatened Moscow's military and economic interests in the region, and the Kremlin could not afford to lose control of this important region. However, if, in the 90s, Russian leaders preferred soft power and tried to negotiate with the elites in Tbilisi, then with Putin's coming to power in the noughties, foreign policy towards Georgia became aggressive. As a counterbalance to Georgian Euro integration, the Kremlin began an active policy of distributing Russian passports to residents of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. In this way, it's trying to bind the local population more strongly to Moscow. In early 2008, Putin issued a decree recognizing the legislative documents created by the separatist republics. Later in April, the Russian government announced an increase in the number of its troops in unrecognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia, claiming that Georgia was allegedly planning an invasion of Abkhazia. When U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice visited Tbilisi on July 8th, four Russian military aircraft crossed Georgian airspace. As the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs later stated, this was done in order to allow hotheads in Tbilisi to cool down. Finally, in midsummer, both sides almost simultaneously conducted military exercises in the region. To show its support, the United States sent about a thousand troops to Georgia for a war game called Immediate Response 2008. Meanwhile, Russia deployed about 8,000 of its own troops to the border with Georgia for an exercise called Caucasus 2008. At that time, it was clear to everyone that war was coming. All that was missing was one flashpoint. And it happened on the 1st of August when an improvised explosive device detonated on the road near Tuskinvali near a Georgian police vehicle, wounding five police officers. In response, Georgian snipers fired on South Ossetian positions, killing four Ossetians and wounding seven. Later that day, South Ossetian separatists began intensively shelling Georgian villages. This caused Georgian peacekeepers and servicemen in the area to return fire. The South Ossetian authorities began a mass evacuation of the population, and Russia sent its military units to the border with Georgia through the Roki Tunnel. Although the intensity of the fighting increased daily, Georgia was still trying to resolve the conflict diplomatically. On August 3rd, Georgian minister Timur Yakobashvili traveled to South Ossetia to propose direct talks, but he was not let into Tuskinvali, and the separatists refused to meet him. On the contrary, South Ossetian president, Edward Kokoidi, said that about 300 volunteers had arrived from Russia to help fight the Georgians, and thousands more were expected from the North Caucasus. On the evening of August 7, Saakashvili ordered a preemptive strike and a full-scale offensive on the capital of the unrecognized republic. At 2335, Georgian artillery launched smoke bombs into South Ossetia. This was followed by a 15-minute intermission, which purportedly enabled the civilians to escape, before the Georgian forces began bombarding hostile positions. After several hours, Georgian forces started moving in the direction of Tuskinvali and engaged South Ossetian forces and militia at 4 o'clock on the 8th of August. The Georgian 4th Brigade advanced on the left side of Tuskinvali early in the morning, and the 3rd Brigade advanced on the right side. After capturing the heights near the city, Georgian troops entered Tuskinvali. By the afternoon, they had taken control of the city and several adjacent villages. However, they failed to blockade the Gupta Bridge and the key roads linking Tuskinvali with the Roki Tunnel and the Russian military base in Java. Under the slogan of helping national minorities, Russia begins its invasion of Georgia. Thanks to the policy of distributing Russian passports to residents of South Ossetia, 
the Kremlin now officially declares war and claims to protect its citizens living in the unrecognized republic. On the morning of August 7, Russian aviation began bombing the territory of Georgia. The military units went to counter the Georgian army. At around 5 p.m., Russian tank columns surrounded Tiskin Valley and began bombing the Georgian positions. At the same time, the Georgian foreign minister called on foreign countries to pressure the Russian leadership to stop the direct military aggression on the territory of Georgia. In response, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said, You wanted us to be peacekeepers, and we are doing that. On the morning of August 9th, Russia ceased to skin volley. In the rest of the territory, Russian air forces worked to destroy Georgian air defense systems. After Russian aviation managed to destroy the main radars and completely mastered the skies over Georgia, organized armed resistance to the invasion effectively ceased. Russian military units moved to their designated lines without resistance. The Georgian command withdrew its forces and began preparing to defend Tbilisi. The conflict escalated to another separatist region, Abkhazia, where units of the unrecognized republic and Russian mercenaries began attacking Georgian positions in the Kadori Gorge. The situation significantly deteriorated on August 11, when Russia expanded the range of its attacks not only on targets in the immediate vicinity of the battlefield, but also launched an offensive on the city of Gori, on the way to Tbilisi, and seized the Georgian cities of Zugdidi and Sanaki in the west of the country. Russian troops also captured the central highway connecting eastern and western Georgia. As the front line approached Tbilisi, the city panicked, and residents began to flee the fighting area. Mikhail Saakashvili tried to reassure the population and assured them that Georgian troops were ready to defend the capital. Understanding that Georgia could not confront Russia military, the country's leadership began to look for ways to reconcile. France, which held the EU presidency then, took the initiative to settle the conflict. On August 12, Russian president at that time, Medvedev, who was de facto ruled by Putin, announced the termination of the peace enforcement operation in Georgia. According to the peace plan, both sides of the conflict had to stop all military operations, withdraw troops, and begin to discuss the future status of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. However, immediately after the signing of the peace agreement, Russia violated it and continued to actively advance deep into Georgian territory. Gori, Sanaki, and Poti were occupied, and the road connecting western and eastern Georgia was cut. On August 16, Russia blew up a railroad bridge in the village of Gurkali, which not only connects the east and west of Georgia, but is also the only link to the world for neighboring Armenia. Russian troops sank Georgian ships in the port of Poti, destroying a civilian radar on Mount Makata and a Gori military base and took over the Ingori hydroelectric power plant. The Russians explained their actions by the need to create a security zone around South Ossetia and Abkhazia with peacekeeping forces. Failing to fulfill the agreements forced the French president to revisit Moscow. This time, realizing that the European Union was not ready for a confrontation with Russia, the Kremlin succeeded in changing the signed agreement on its own terms. In particular, the clauses concerning the withdrawal of Russian troops from the territory of the unrecognized republics and further discussion of their status disappeared from the agreement. Moscow agreed to withdraw its army only from the territories occupied in August, but retained complete control over South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Russia won the war. The 2008 war was the first time since the collapse of the Soviet Union that the Russian military was used against an independent state. For the first time, Russia demonstrated its willingness to use military force to achieve its political goals. By constantly fueling the internal Georgian conflict, Russia has used it as a way to influence the region and stop Georgia's integration into international organizations. Soon after the war, Georgia proclaimed that it would exit the ex-Soviet Commonwealth of Independent States, which it held responsible for not avoiding the war. The war hindered the country's prospects for joining NATO for the foreseeable future. Medvedev stated in November 2011 
that NATO would have accepted former Soviet republics if Russia had not attacked Georgia. If you had faltered back in 2008, the geopolitical situation would be different now. Yet, Western countries did not feel it was necessary to aggravate tensions with Russia over tiny and insignificant Georgia. Western policymakers did not want to alienate Russia because its support was necessary to solve international problems. The first European War of the 21st century showed Russia's assertiveness in revising international relations and undermining the hegemony of the United States. In 2016, during a geography lesson, Putin asked a student, where do the borders of Russia end? The student answered, Russia's borders end across the Bering Strait with the United States. To which Putin replied, Russia's borders do not end anywhere. <laughs>